Hola! Yo soy el script monk. Welcome back to all you true lovers of screencraft, loud, irritating voices, and lo-fi visual aesthetics. I'm picking up right where I left off last time. In my last video, I talked about the front half of Hollywood story structure, particularly how it all leads to a midpoint crisis event. Click on that above if you haven't seen it yet. So it only makes sense in this video to keep wading into the deeper end of the pool to the second half of story structure, which is much trickier than you might think. Because unbeknownst to many, this structure actually splits into multiple possible paths in the second half. So in this video, I'm going to walk you down these various paths and explain the reason for all this structural splitting. How do you get there, you ask? Take the Santa Ana Freeway to the Santa Monica Freeway. Take the Slauson cut off, stop the car, cut off your Slauson, get back in the car. Now there are two things that really determine the structural path of a movie's second half. And the first is pretty simple. The question of whether the protagonist is to win or lose in the story's end. Is the story meant to conclude in victory or failure, reward or punishment, salvation or damnation? Now you might think this question isn't decided until the story's climax. Well it isn't for the audience, but for the character this outcome is actually decided much earlier and it doesn't have so much to do with the plot as it does with the character arc. In previous videos I said that the Hollywood philosophy on characters is essentially Darwinian. It's evolve or perish. More specifically, characters need to evolve in the specific ways required by their situation or else be defeated by that situation. So characters who gain a greater awareness and adapt themselves accordingly will always succeed, while those who remain ignorant or stubborn will always fail. My mistake was grabbing the cheese. In my last video, I talked about how the protagonist's inadequate attitudes and behaviors make the situation worse and worse over the story's first half, until it leads to a midpoint crisis event that makes the need for change apparent. And as I said, after this crisis, there is a decisive moment that sets the course for the rest of the story to follow, what I call the moment of crucial decision. Again, the moment of crucial decision is that psychological crossroads, crossroads where the protagonist must either take their first steps down a path of personal change or they reject change and remains on a faulty path. The crossroads metaphor is apt as this is the point where story structure splits into two paths, with one leading to victory and the other leading to defeat. What this basically means is that once the protagonist makes their crucial decision, their fate is essentially sealed though both they and the audience don't yet realize it. For those who choose the proper path, the road might be long and difficult and might be filled with ups and downs, but as long as they stick to it, they will eventually reach victory. But for those who choose the faulty path, they essentially become dead heroes walking. They're on the wrong road, going in the wrong direction, only getting farther and farther away from a proper resolution. They're already doomed and don't even know it. The second structural factor is just when and where this moment of crucial decision occurs. See, unlike a movie's major dramatic plot points, like the inciting incident, the end of Act 1 turning point, and the midpoint, which are part of the story's geometry, and thus must take place at certain points for the sake of pace and momentum, the major events of a character arc can be placed wherever's best suited for the particular story being told. Now, in a lot of movies, I'd say around 50%, the crucial decision happens right here, right after the midpoint crisis event. This happens because it's often the most logical place to put it. The crisis forces the protagonist to stop, reevaluate their previous actions, and then decide how they are going to respond to the crisis, either by doing things differently or by sticking to their same old faulty ways. For example, in The Matrix, Neo's problem is that he doesn't believe in Morpheus's faith that he is the one. When Morpheus is captured at the midpoint, Neo is put at a crossroads. He could follow his weakness and decide nothing could be done, but instead, Neo takes his first step towards change, deciding to do something to live up to Morpheus's faith. Likewise, in Back to the Future, Marty's reckless actions create a midpoint crisis that threatens his life. So, probably after a lecture from Doc, Marty sets out to fix the crisis by adopting more prudent, less impulsive behaviors. However, putting the crucial decision right after the midpoint isn't always the best choice for every type of story and every type of protagonist. Imagine for a second if in Casablanca, Rick decided to give up his ego and help Ilsa and Laszlo halfway through the story. Well, the second half of Casablanca would been an entirely different movie, and the whole Act 2B love triangle would have been lost. So instead, the writers realized it was better to keep Rick on the fence for as long as possible, drawing out the question of what road he'll ultimately choose. So out of the need for flexibility, we have a third structural option, that of a delayed crucial decision, which will itself dovetail at some later point, depending on where the crucial decision is put here, 
or here, or even as late as here. So now I'm gonna walk you down each one of these paths, which are all kinda similar in some ways, but also different in ways that really affect the action of Act 2B and into Act 3. So after the midpoint crisis, the protagonist realizes that things have gone from bad to worse, their previous actions haven't been cutting it, and they need to figure out how to do better. But the moment of crucial decision isn't some light switch moment where the character suddenly becomes a new person. People often use the word epiphany for the character arc, but an epiphany literally means the recognition of God. It's a lightning bolt out of nowhere that suddenly reveals the truth. What happened here was a miracle, and I want you to acknowledge it. So it's actually a rare and extreme occurrence. More often, the motivation to change is purely practical. There's a problematic situation that must be resolved. The old methods haven't been working, so the hero needs to figure out better, more effective methods. And it might be even more subtle than this. Sometimes the crisis simply affects the way the protagonist views themselves or the situation, and this small shift in perspective initiates a movement towards greater change. In any case, the protagonist's old faulty ways don't just go away. They may have been challenged, but change is difficult and old habits die hard. So Act 2B presents an internal battle within the protagonist. Physically, the protagonist sets out a new course of action, but the whole time they have the angel and the devil on their shoulders, each trying to pull the hero in their own direction. When they take the angel's advice and try to act in new, better, more effective ways, their situation improves little by little. But when the devil gets in their ear, they fall back on their old, faulty ways, causing them to struggle and fail once more. And this back and forth struggle is what causes the ups and downs, successes and setbacks of Act 2B. If you want a different analogy, trying to follow the path of change while holding on to the old ways makes the hero like a mountain climber weighed down by a lot of unnecessary equipment. All that extra junk isn't going to help you succeed. You gotta cut it loose or it'll cause you to fall. And this all comes to a head at the end of Act 2B turning point. As movie structure's fourth major dramatic event, the end of Act 2B turning point is often the most dramatic event of a story, aside from the climax itself. And on the path of change, it tends to come about in one of two ways. In some cases, the protagonist relapses back into their old faulty ways and starts making poor decisions and dumb mistakes once again. So just like at the midpoint, this ends up creating another, even bigger crisis. In other cases, the protagonist has been making good progress along their new path. However, this transformation has yet to be fully tested. So the act ends with the onset of a major challenge through which the protagonists must now prove themselves. Whichever way we go, this event usually triggers the second critical moment of the character arc, what I call the moment of full commitment. Here, the crisis or challenge compels the protagonist to finally abandon their faulty old ways and fully embrace the necessary change. For example, in The Matrix, Neo has been gaining strength and confidence in Act 2B, but this transformation meets its ultimate test when he's confronted by Agent Smith. Now, Neo could give in to his doubts and run away, but instead... What is he doing? He's beginning to believe. Neo fully commits. It's hard to deny the spiritual overtones of this moment. A formerly flawed person throws away who they once were and surrenders themselves to a higher ideal. In the process, they are purged, purified, and imbued with a new spirit. I've talked about the mythic cycle of death and rebirth. This is that moment. The old protagonist dies and they are reborn a new, more perfect individual. Okay, it's not always so spiritual, but in any case, this moment of full commitment empowers the protagonist with the strength, skills, or understanding they'll need in the final act to finally overcome the conflict and resolve the story problem. However, once again, the moment of full commitment doesn't have to occur right after the end of Act 2B. That's usually the most logical place to put it, but again, the story might work better if it occurs later, like it does in Star Wars. Luke Skywalker makes his crucial decision right after the midpoint. He decides to stop being passive and start taking heroic action, beginning his maturation into someone worthy of the name Jedi. But Luke doesn't fully surrender to this path until this moment, when he obeys Obi-Wan's words to trust the Force. But without this full commitment, it's doubtful Luke would have succeeded. So by delaying this moment, extra suspense is added to the climax. But in contrast to guys like Luke, we got protagonists with no hope of victory, because they make all the wrong decisions from the start. Going back to the start of the crossroads, some protagonists refuse to learn anything from the midpoint crisis, even though they are always somehow to blame. But they think, it's not my fault, it's all something else's fault. So I don't need to change the way I do things. I just need to go bigger. I just need to push things to another level. So rather than change, a foolish protagonist escalates their faulty behaviors. 
They either ignore the crisis and hit the gas, or they try to smash their way through their problems through pure brute force. For example, in Goodfellas, Henry Hill is a gangster living the gangster life. He pays the price for this at the midpoint when he ends up in prison. Now Henry could learn a lesson from this and realize he needs to make some changes in life, but instead Henry pushes things to the next level, setting up his own private dope trade in Act 2B. Likewise, in Citizen Kane, Kane loses the public's love and respect when his flaws are revealed at the midpoint. But rather than learn some humility, Kane doubles down, setting out on a mad quest to get the world to respect him again whether they want to or not. But you know, as it's said, the definition of madness is to keep doing things the same way and expecting different results. So while this intensified course of action might meet some initial success, they're only digging themselves into a hole once again, one even deeper than before. You can only stack crap so high before it topples over. So eventually the plan falls apart and the protagonist collides with yet another even bigger crisis at the end of Act 2B. The point of this crisis is to give the protagonist one last chance, one last chance to finally turn things around and see the error of their ways. But again, the protagonist refuses to see the light, instead commits to a decision that can only lead to their final doom. Like in Goodfellas, everything is falling apart for Henry Hill. His friends are killing each other, and he has legitimate reason to fear that he might be next. Does Henry get out while he can? No, of course not. He refuses to leave his faulty path. In Citizen Kane, Kane's plans fail miserably in Act 2B, losing him even more love and respect. But again, instead of learning anything, Kane chooses to reject the world and retreats into total isolation. I call this moment the nail in the coffin, because with this decision, the characters permanently seal their sad, miserable fates. But again, the nail in the coffin doesn't have to happen right after the end of Act 2B. The story might work better if it happens in the middle of the act, or if the protagonist stupidly dooms himself right before the climax. In any case, Act 3 becomes a downward spiral as all these consequences play out, bottoming out in total defeat, an end made all the more tragic by the fact that it all could have been avoided if only the protagonist had read the signposts and followed a better path. But you know, you might be thinking, hey, I know some movies where the anti-hero does turn things around late in the story. Well, you're thinking of path number three. As I've said, the key moments of the character arc can be placed wherever is the best fit for the particular story being told. So the crucial decision might work better here, or maybe here, or even as late as here. But even though the crucial decision is delayed, the protagonist must still take a new course of action in Act 2B, because after all something went wrong at the midpoint and the protagonist must do something about it. But since the crucial decision has not yet occurred, there is yet to be any major change in the character's attitudes and behaviors. So, this new course ends up playing out much like the one before it. Despite maybe some early success, it proves faulty yet again, revealing yet another major crisis at the end of Act 2B. So now the situation has twice gone from bad to worse, and time is running out. So the protagonist now really needs to sit down, reevaluate their past behaviors, and figure out what road to take before everything goes to hell. So once again, the most logical place to put a delayed crucial decision is after the end of Act Crisis. But of course, it depends on the needs of the story and the nature of the protagonist's arc. If, for instance, you have the kind of arc that requires a real quiet emotional scene to bring about the crucial decision, it might be better to put this someplace in the middle of Act 2B, as things might be too hectic at the end of the act. But you can even put the crucial decision much later, as happened happens in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Some people think Indiana Jones doesn't have a character arc, but this is only because his crucial decision comes super late. Indy's issue is that he only considers the material value of things, whether it's the treasure he seeks or the human relationships he uses to get them, while disregarding the possibility of any greater immaterial value. We don't see any real shift in Indy's priorities until this scene in the middle of Act 3, where Indy declares his will to give up the arc for the sake of his relationship with Marion. But no matter where the MCD occurs, the structure will once again split into two paths, one for characters who accept change, one for those who reject it. And these shorter wise and foolish paths play out just like the longer versions, except all the content has been compressed and shifted further back into the narrative. So if your MCD happens here, there might still be enough breathing room to put the full commitment or nail on the coffin here as usual, but it might be better to push it back to here or here. But if your crucial decision happens after the end of Act 2B, the full commitment or nail on the coffin ought to occur somewhere in the middle of Act 3 or right before the climax, as happens in Raiders. Now this whole time I've been kind of talking around what happens at the big end of Act 2B turning point. I've done so because despite what some sources will tell you, there are actually many ways to pull off this big event. 
So I'm going to dedicate my next video exclusively to the end of Act 2e turning point with the five most common forms it takes, so you can decide what works best for your own story. Until then, if you want some homework, think over some movies that end in victory and some that end in failure. Where is the fatal crossroads? How does the protagonist struggle afterwards? And where might be the moment of full commitment or the nail in the coffin? And as always, if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. And if you like this channel and you want to share it with more screenwriter types, leave a comment and click the like button because the more interaction a video gets, the more YouTube shares it with new people, which is why everybody tells you to do that. And hey, I just crossed the thousand subscriber mark, so I just want to thank everyone who subscribed so far, especially those from the very beginning, because I couldn't have gotten this far without you. So until next time, I'm the Script Monk. Adios. Crossroads!